Welcome back to episode 10 of the Theo Jaffe podcast. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Laron Shapira. By day, Laron is an entrepreneur, angel investor, and the CEO of Counseling Startup Relationship Hero. By night, Laron is deeply involved in the rationalist movement and is one of Twitter's most prominent advocates for AI safety. As usual, we go in depth on various aspects of the AI doom debate, where he agrees and disagrees with Eliezer Yukowski, the various AI and non-AI risks that humanity faces, the differences between human and ASI intelligences, and his critique of Quentin Pope and Nora Belrose's AI optimism movement. We also talk about how a high probability of doom impacts his personal life, his background in the rationality community, and his skeptical views on the crypto industry. This is the Theo Jaffe Podcast. Thank you for listening. And now here's Lerone Shapira. Hi, welcome back to episode 10, 10th episode of the Theo Jaffe Podcast. Here today with Lerone Shapira. The Ojafi podcast. I'm a big fan. I've been listening to the catalog. Glad to hear it. So let's get into some of our first questions. So obviously we, yeah, we, we know that you're very interested in and worried about existential AI risk, but how worried are you about non-existential AI risks, especially because, you know, more and more powerful AIs are drawing near. We saw a demo just like a day or two ago of like text to video that looked decent for the first time. So non-existential risks like, you know, jobs, like, you know, what if we end up in a future with, you know, aligned superintelligence, but humans lose agency or meaning, just anything in that category. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, when I think about the non-AI existential risk, I'm not super worried, but a couple of things come to mind. Uh, nuclear risk and bio risk would be the top two, I think, below AI existential risk. I think nuclear risk is profoundly underrated. You know, I think it's been described as something like 1% per year. Maybe if you look at this, the rest of the century as a whole, I might put it at like 15% chance of due, maybe 20, right? Because maybe the risks are correlated. So it's not like independent events of 1% per year. But like, I think nuclear risk is underrated. And I know that people love to say, oh my God, people are overblowing nuclear risk. It gave us nuclear energy. Focus on the nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is safe. And they're right that nuclear energy is safe, but that doesn't justify how risky nuclear explosions are. It's like, hello, we still have these arsenals, okay? Let's not forget. And like, yeah, it's great that nuclear power plants are good power plants, but nuclear risk is still sitting there. You know, like these 50 megaton devices are still sitting there, right? Like that, and there's all these incidents where like they almost went off. So like, I just think it's underrated and maybe I would be like a big nuclear doomer, but it's just hard for me to focus on that kind of thing when I think that the AI doom probability is 10 to 100 times greater. So I'm like, okay, great. Put that aside. That's not my cause. But that might be my runner-up cause. Yeah. I meant more like um, not existential risks that are not AI, but AI risks that are not existential. I gotcha. Okay. That's an important distinction. Um, I tend to not really be concerned about the AI risks that aren't existential unless they're like near existential, right? So if we're talking about, oh, humanity is all like slaves to the AI, but we're still like kept alive with morphine, I guess I'm pretty worried about that. Well, I just think that's not plausible, but like I would consider that like pretty bad. But then if you go down to like, uh, social media is going to like be more addictive, then I become less concerned. Do you think S risks are plausible? I do think that us risks are plausible, right? So it's the idea, you know, suffering risks uh, for the listeners, right? It's the idea that like we're creating these uh, moral agents, moral persons, right? So like within the AI, maybe it's just trying to simulate what a human would say, but that simulation is a person or it has moral value. And it's hard to prove that there's not a moral person inside of these AIs. I mean, presumably there's not yet because they're not quite powerful enough, but as they grow more powerful, it's very plausible to me that they can have a consciousness, right? Within the inscrutable matrices and they can have somebody that has rights or that you don't want to harm. So that's very plausible. And we're just confused about consciousness. We're, we're confused about morality beyond humans and the animals. So I think as risks are like very plausible and then, you know, turning the tables, that's like us causing harm to the AI, but then the AI could also cause harm to us or to copies of us. So I definitely think we could enter like a hell where we're like all getting tortured for trillions of years. Like, I think that's a plausible outcome. It's just not quite my mainline outcome, right? My mainline outcome is we just kind of all get swept away and we just get like paper clips or something that happens to like not be conscious and not be interesting. That's kind of my default. Hmm. By plausible, like how likely do you think that is? Hmm. Like how likely do I think an S risk universe is? I don't know, probably less than 10%, like ballpark. I, I'd say more than 1%. That's just like a very rough ballpark, right? So I don't, I definitely don't want to write it off. 
It's just that if we're even talking about that, it's kind of like we've already gone pretty far where I'm trying to push the discussion right now, right? It's like, that's the discussion I want to have. I would love to be like, hey, are we all going to just die unceremoniously and have the universe burn itself out with no consciousness? Or is there also going to be tortured consciousness, right? If that was the dichotomy, I'd be like, great, let's have that discussion. Hmm. Well, speaking of probabilities, uh, the notion of P-Doom has been dumped upon a lot recently, including the clip you posted of my podcast where I asked V about his... <laughs> That's right. You got a good dunking there for sure. Yeah. And and so people say like, it's not rigorous and it's basically, um, even someone as prominent as David Deutsch said, basically like, oh yeah, the steps to getting a P doom are like, pick a number between zero and one, not too far or not too close to either of those bounds. And then you're done. So first of all, like what, what is your P doom if you have one? And second of all, like how rigorous do you think your methods of getting it are? So my P doom is 50% by 2040, uh, which is like Svi said, like Jan Lakey said, a ballpark figure. So you can also call it 10 to 90. And this is when the dunks come out, right? The knives out, people are like, you're just making up numbers. How is 50 the same as 10 to 90? So just to give a basic explanation, um, if you just need a single probability, which you do for the purpose of decision-making, then you can go with 50% by 2040. There is your single probability. Why give a range? One way to explain a range is that it's uh, the variance of a Monte Carlo simulation of different mental models about likely possibilities that I might have. So I could be like, oh, there's a possibility where the world gets its act together and coordinates to stop AI. That's like one mental model. And there's a totally different mental model where we just accelerate as hard as we can and then the AI fooms, right? So you have to, there's so many different mental models that are all feeding into this one probability, right? It's crazy to compress it down to one dimension. And yet you have no choice because when you make decisions, right? When you do expected utility, you have to plug in a probability number. There's only one future, right? So all you can do is wait things that could have influenced the possible future. So anyway, so that's why I say 10 to 90. That's why Jan Lakey says 10 to 90. Um, and then, you know, people have so many objections. They're like, where did you get the number from? Um, and that for that, I'd say, think about the ballpark, think about the order of magnitude. So if I say, hey, 50.0 or 53.25, then it's like, whoa, where? okay, I'm making up a number. But if I come at it from the other way and I'm like, hey, I bet the probability is a lot higher than 0.01%, suddenly I'm saying something pretty obvious, right? Because you can imagine so many scenarios that are plausible, like maybe Foom is real. Okay, don't you think there's at least a 0.01% chance that Foom is, is real, right? So if I slide all the way back to 0.01%, at some point you start subjectively telling me like, you're obviously underestimating this right? So like 50%, suddenly I'm like an idiot pulling numbers out of my rear. 0.01%, okay, I'm obviously underestimating. So if you just become more continuous with how you react to what I'm saying, there's going to be some happy medium where I'm saying something when you're like, okay, this seems vague, this seems um, rough, yet you can't do better and you have to give a number. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I guess one exercise in PDOM is we've had atomic bombs for like 80 years now. And you could say mm -hmm. maybe like, the probability of nuclear doom in any given year was what one to five percent something like that and yet we are still here and it seems quite unlikely you know not totally unlikely but quite unlikely that we'll be vaporized by nukes within the next few years so could it be right. possible that um your intuitions for he doom might be higher than it would actually be in real life especially over long time periods with like robust systems like civilization um, I mean, so you're using the example of we've had nukes for 80 years, and let's say that there was a 1% chance that they could annihilate, you know, more than 10% or even 50% of humanity. So every year we're rolling the dice and we only have a 99% chance to survive, 1% chance to die. So it looks like 99% to the power of 80 is 44%. So surviving a century is only like a coin flip, right? So I'm pretty content to be like, okay, we got lucky on a coin flip. Right. So like, I don't think that my model of 1% of your nuclear risk is invalidated. And especially when you look at where the model comes from, like you almost have these things go off, right? You have Cuban missile crisis, you have Petrov, you have safety checks on like a test flight over Spain, three out of four of the safety things failing. Like there's, there's near misses. So when you talk about 10 to 90% P doom, you mentioned like, oh, once you get into like too low numbers, you know, you're obviously overestimating it. So like, do you think of 99.5%, which is Eliezer's number of P-Doom, as like, well, you're obviously overestimating it, just like you would with a 
with Eliezer, I think that he would probably agree with my perspective, which is that like 99.5% is kind of the on model probability. So like if you understand what Eliezer does about the relevant theory, you know, optimization processes, computational processes, right? So like he's an expert at a lot of the relevant theories. And he's like, based on my understanding, what AI labs are trying to build is something like a perpetual motion machine. And so my model just doesn't say that this can proceed with a significant probability of success. It's kind of like, hey, a bunch of people are building a rocket. You know, the first the first rocket that anybody's ever built is going to try to orbit the Earth. There's just a very low probability of success on model. But I think Eliezer would agree with my own claim, which is like, okay, but you never know unknown unknowns. Like there's probably like a 1% chance that it'll be revealed to be true what a few people are accusing Eliezer of, that he's completely clueless and his rationality makes no sense and his probability makes no sense, right? And like, that could be revealed that we're all just like clueless people, right? And some people are urging us to see that reality already, right? And just for that, you have to give a one or 2% chance just of that, right? So there's the off model probabilities that I think Eliezer would admit are like worth mixing in a little bit. You said 10 to 90%, 50% by 2040. What about like 2100? Is it significantly higher or like the same or lower? Even? I think it's I think it's highly correlated, right? So I think like if FOOM is going to happen, um, it'll slightly more likely probably happen before 2040. I think if you go to, let's say, 2060, then I'd probably push it up to like, I don't know, 60%. It's hard, it's hard to push it beyond 60% because like when I quote the figure, I give myself a lot more just like unknown unknowns. Like I'm clueless. I'm not as confident in what I'm saying in general as Eliezer is, which I think he has a right to be more confident. I do think he's a master of a lot more relevant theory than I am. Um, so I don't think it goes that much beyond 50% because I just start getting into the like, I don't know what I'm talking about range of things. Uh, but you can definitely push it to 60, maybe 70 if you go all the way to like 2060. When you go past 2060, at that point, it's like, well, what's going on? Why hasn't it foomed yet, right? So at that point, it starts undermining my assumptions. So it doesn't necessarily get higher because it also gets lower, right? So I don't really know what happens to it. So you respect Eliezer a lot and you think that he knows much more about this stuff than you do, but your PDUM is different. So why is that? Is it just because like you're like less confident in his assumptions? And if so, like which assumptions are you less confident on? So I think that Eliezer's model makes a lot of sense, right? It's just more like whenever I grill him about like little things I don't understand, like, wait, so RLHF breaks down when exactly? And, and like, I've had a few of these conversations with him and he always has really good answers, right? But I can also tell that like I have like an undergraduate level understanding, right? And and he has like a more sophisticated understanding. And I expect that I'm more likely to update toward Eliezer than away from Eliezer. Uh, but I, I guess I'm not comfortable making the full update yet, even though, you know, there's there's some principle as a rationalist where you're supposed to update all the way. But I'm, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I have some uncertainty. So like, I don't know. I don't, The thing is, I don't think that we disagree that much. Like, I think most people who are in the like, it looks like we're going to die camp, which I am too. Like, I don't think there's that fundamental of a distinction between people going like, hey, there's 95% and people going like, hey, there's 50 plus, right? Like, I think we're kind of the same ballpark, which, which is why like when people come and tell me like, hey, my probability is 10%, you know, like Vitalik just said, I'm like, okay, great. Like, I don't want to nitpick 10 versus 50. Like, I just want you to see 10, right? And I'm I, it's, I'm happy to just let you stay at 10. I don't think you have to come to 50. And, you know, you don't have to, because I do think that a lot of what I believe about reading less wrong is just like intuitions that are, you know, the, the, they're salient to me, but like, I understand that they, they may not always be right. And other people can weigh up their intuitions differently. And I don't think that they're making like a big methodological mistake, right? I think it's okay for them to stick with their probabilities until they observe more evidence. Yeah. Do you have any like concrete disagreements with that user? That's a good question. I don't know if I do. Like, I mean, you know, he's where we always have stylistic differences, right? But like, I mean, when it comes to the matter of of AI doom and, and rationality, I mean, I think there's like nitpicks, right? Like there's, uh, if it, there's like an article he wrote a long time ago where he thinks uh, like sometimes you shouldn't use probabilities in certain circumstances. And that was like kind of controversial. And somebody's like, no, just use probabilities. And like, I don't know where I come down on that. And like he said, Eliezer famously says that he thinks that like a lot of animals just like totally aren't conscious. Like he seems pretty confident that like dogs definitely have like no consciousness. And I'm like, I don't know, they seem like they're kind of conscious intuitively, right? So like there's on the edges, on the fringes, I do think that like I start not following them all the way, but on the AI doom like core argument, 
I do pretty much buy it all. Like, I think it makes like a lot of sense. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm definitely somebody who I'm like a good target audience for his writing, because I do think that it's really good. I think it's, you know, still underrated. Um, and it's, I, I, I noticed a little bit of myself in it where it's just like, sometimes I understand something well. So like, I kind of know what it feels like to understand certain technical topics well. And then I read Eliezer and I'm like, wow, well, he understands it even better. And like, I thought I understood it well, but like, he's pointing out some stuff that is actually deeper than my own understanding of a topic that I thought I understood well. So I feel like I have like a good viewpoint to understand like the degree to which this guy knows what he's talking about in a lot of these different articles that he's published. Mm. If you did eventually come to the conclusion that AI risk is less likely than you thought, why do you think that would be? Or do you just like not know? Uh, that's a good question, right? And it's it's kind of similar to the question of just like, um, you know, just imagine do a postmortem or like a post living, right? Of like, hey, it's the year 2060 and we're all alive, right? So what's how do you condition on that? What mental model do you get, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, one easy answer is just like, AI progress, it turned out to be like a really long marathon to get to super intelligence, right? So like, even though it kind of feels like we're speeding to super intelligence and Elon Musk is like, yeah, we're going to have AGI in three years. And even open AI is like, yeah, we might have a corporation this decade that's better than a human corporation that's run by AIs. So even though it feels like we're speeding to AGI and, you know, Kurzweil a long time ago predicted, I think like 2029, maybe it's not, maybe it's 2100, right? Maybe it's 3000. So that would be like an easy answer to why we're not doomed yet, because it's just like everything goes slow. And maybe it goes so slow that we can do alignment research, right? So if somebody just convinced me, like, look how slow it's going, right? And I know Sam Altman said something about, like, we're bottlenecked on data center scale. And my reaction was like, you know, you really don't know that. Like, we definitely could suddenly find ourselves with a bigger hardware overhang than we realize. And one data center could be plenty. But if Sam Altman was spot on and we're bottlenecked on data center scale and, like, we have to scale it up like a thousand times, I mean, ideally a million times, right? That would be like a straightforward way to convince me that we're not doomed for a couple decades. Mm. Well, Elon said three years, but you know, we all know about his record of forecasting stuff. Yeah, it's not great. I don't think it's terrible, um, but it's it's definitely not perfect. Yeah, and I think uh, Rob Bensinger posted Elon's record where I think in 2014, he said that we'll have it by like 2019. So yeah, you can't just automatically assume that Elon's exact forecast is right. I agree with that. Well, I mean, he tends to be right about stuff in the long term, just it takes longer than he says it will. Like self-driving cars, how he's predicted like full self-driving next year, every year for the last like 10 years. Right. No, he has. Yeah. And it's it's kind of funny, right? It's like if and and a lot of times people kind of they catch him, right? <laughs> like they catch him BSing or they catch him being like way off. And it's like, okay, yeah, I'm starting to think this guy is like not trustworthy. But then at the same time, it's like he launches Starship and like lands the rockets. And I'm like, man. You know, there's like a, a good enough distribution of like miracles mixed with like, okay, this is kind of BS, but this is like a legit miracle that like overall I'm pretty, pretty bullish on Elon. But then of course there was a time when he started open AI and, and like, you know, shortened the timeline by a few years, which Eliezer has said, I think he has a good point, kind of overshadows anything else Elon Musk has ever done to kind of stoke the AI arms race. Like in the end, and by the end, I mean like potentially in a few years, like that is the single biggest impact that he's done arguably. What about XAI? Do you think that's made it worse or? Um, so far, it just seems like they're they're not, you know, moving the convex hole of what's possible, right? So like until they get there, I'm sure they're trying their fastest to get there. Um, you know, if they start releasing something that's like GPT-5 equivalent before GPT-5, then I'll be like, damn it, XAI, you know, <laughs> like why does Elon have to keep making things worse? Um, but for now, I guess it's, it's, I guess the question remains of like, you know, is, is Elon's 20% project going to be competitive with Sam Altman and Dario's number one project, it's probably not going to make things that much worse. It's it's hard to say, right? We got to watch it. Well, would Elon just drop a GPT-5 model in the world? He seems to be like far more concerned about X risk than maybe any other like mm -hmm. major AI lab leader. So Elon gets massive points for, you know, as early as the 2015 conference coming in there being like, hey, I'm just a rich billionaire with a ton of credibility outside this field. And I think AI risk is indeed very dangerous, right? Like Bostrom has a point and he gets massive rationality points for saying that. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the things he said about AI recently are like kind of ridiculous, right? Like when he talks about like, I'm going to make a truth GPT, I'm going to make a GPT that's not woke. I mean, I guess those are valid considerations in terms of like the next couple of years, right? Like mundane utility, fine. But when he says stuff like, 
I think AI is going to be nice to humans because humans are interesting. It's like, okay, Elon, come on, man. You're, you have Jeff Hinton, like he's talking to these luminaries and they should be disabusing you of, of these kind of notions, right? Like the idea that that is some equilibrium that humans are going to be interesting. Like uh, humans are, are anywhere near the optimum for interestingness. And so that's going to be some kind of equilibrium. It's like, why, why are you publicly posting this stuff? It's like the fate of the world is largely in your hands, Elon. And that is like not a plausible theory. So there's alignment research and then there's like governance research. And it seems like the default political plan for like rationalist um, decel doomers, whatever you want to call it, is slightly pejorative, but you know, people who are concerned about X risk is slow down AI and give the authority to build AI either to nobody or to like a trusted group of people. So do you worry that like this increases centralization risk a lot? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, so my position is that like the the actual constructive Doomer plan is fraught with peril, right? Like it's it's a tough plan, right? It's like the the ideal would be something like a trusted Manhattan project, which seems unthinkable in today's environment. But if we really could get together the scientists, right, and have some level of trust and common purpose, the way we had in the Manhattan project, that may be the single best setup that gives us a chance, as long as all of those scientists are top tier, right? Our Nobel Prize winning physicists um, or their students or whatever, and people who just appreciate what we're up against uh, and are taking it seriously the same way they took the nuclear bomb seriously. Um, I do think we would have a chance to win the race between capabilities and alignment. But of course, today it's so unpalatable because people don't realize we're in a war. They don't realize that the enemy is unaligned AI, right? So it just seems like so such an impedance mismatch. People are like, what the heck are you talking about, Manhattan Project? But short of that, um, you know, I just I just think time is running out and we keep slipping farther and farther from the, the possibility of a good outcome. But like, I think we're between a rock and a hard place because you can give a million criticisms to the Doomer suggestion of let's centralize everything in a Manhattan project. Like, I agree, that sucks. But the alternative is worse. And like so many people are saying, you have to take it as an assumption that you have to run things for profit and China is going to repeat uh, compete with you. Like these things are inviolable axioms that you have to start with and i'm like wait can i get an inviolable axiom that ai is going to kill us because like it's a rock and a hard place it's like they're both hard situations i just think that the ai killing us one is even harder and we have to deal with it so scott alexander recently published uh like an update of his p doom from like 33 percent to like 20 percent based on you know super forecasters and the world at large thinking that AI risk is not like overwhelmingly likely. So has that impacted you at all? Or do you just think like, no, they're wrong? So I know this was one of the controversial things from your interview with Tzvi, right? Where Tzvi was able to kind of dismiss the super forecasters, which is, you know, kind of a shocking move in, in the rationality sphere, right? Like one does not simply dismiss a super forecaster forecast. And he even argued with you, he's like, actually the fact that super forecasters are dismissing it so easily might make you update the other way where it's like they clearly didn't take the problem seriously so i'm going to discount their opinion right so it's v had some pretty good arguments that i thought made sense um i don't want to throw it out entirely so like you know i'm happy to update a little bit but i don't want to do a massive update right it's more like okay i'll slightly update down a few percent that's more how i feel about it um because i do think there are a lot of problems with that project like i do think that um, like it happened in 2022. I don't even think that they had the milieu of like chat GPT and people getting excited and, and luminaries coming out, right? Like, okay, they're using base rates. How's this for a base rate? Like a bunch of luminaries coming out and warning about a new technology, right? It's like, I do think that if you look at the super forecaster methodology and you ask in what scenario might this hallowed methodology actually fail, right? At a methodology level, not disputing the, the conclusion, but disputing the methodology. I do think this looks like a good candidate for a time when they might fail. And I've also made the analogy to um, another thing that uses pure logic. This is in addition to the stuff that Svi was saying about like their incentives were wrong, uh, and they you know they didn't research the logic of the problem that much. Another analogy I would make to build on what Svi said is like if you look at uh, crypto, for instance, um, I was in the position of being a crypto skeptic when crypto was still pretty popular and kind of calling the peak of the bubble and being like you know there's the, the logic of blockchain having applications beyond cryptocurrency is flawed. I'm not sure a team of super forecasters would have predicted a 99% contraction, right? Like a fundamental qualitative contraction in this industry 
based on super forecaster methodology. I don't think there was a super forecaster tournament then, but if there were, it also seems like the kind of thing that would slip by super forecasting. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, this super forecaster study that I was talking about with Z, first of all, my interview with Z was like four months ago. And, you know, of course, the survey was farther back than that. But like, it doesn't seem to have changed much in that time. I don't think the world as a whole is more doomy than it was like a few months ago. And like, actually, a lot of even rationalist type people seem to be less doomy than they used to be. Like one example, just off the top of my head, is this a non-account called Lump and Space Prin Princeps, which right. um, they used to be kind of like, you know, fully in the Eliezer Gunkowski rationalism, AI doom, foom camp. And now they're like, wait a minute. It seems that like RLHF is actually like working pretty well and GPTs are not like kind of, you know, monomaniacal paperclip maximizer type things. And so maybe, you know, this, there's not a 99.5% PDOM. It's, you know, less than what I thought it was. And of course, you know, yeah. prediction markets mm -hmm. still rated a lot less than what you do. I mean, it's true that every time we see AI do something new and not foom, then we have to update a little bit, even if it's not that surprising. Like it's not a massive update when we learn that AI can do something new and not foom. The massive update only comes when AI can do everything in the domain of the universe, right? Like be given goals. I always talk about goal to action mapping. Like if it can be a better CEO than a human, if it can be a better general problem solver than a human, and then not foom, that's when I do the big update, right? And, and I don't even, that's hard for me to even describe coherently, right? Because it, it's almost by logical definition. That's something that, that's better at goals than human, you know, discovers foom as an instrumental goal and, and go and we're off to the races. But if somehow that doesn't happen, right? If if they're like always bottlenecked by hardware or something, right? Or or like suddenly complexity theory has properties that that I'm not anticipating or whatever. Um, that's when the big update happens. But when it's like, hey, look, it can, you know, get a score on on a lot of these tests that humans can and yet can't actually problem solve for whatever reason. Um you know, that that's, I only make a small update. Um, so lump in, it's like, yeah, sure, make a small update. But also the problem is that time is running out. So by default, time is not on our side. Every day that goes by where capabilities progress and we don't have a massive alignment breakthrough, now there's less time left in the race and alignment is falling farther behind every day or at least didn't gain any ground. And the buzzer is about to sound. And the buzzer is basically when it gets better at problem solving than humanity. So even when it feels like, hey, nothing's happened in the last month, no, incremental capabilities progress has happened in the last month. And you know, NVIDIA and Intel and Apple, Silicon, all these chips have gotten faster, right? This hardware has gotten better. Time is running out. So I'm not as updating toward optimism as they are, but I also agree. It's like, look, the government is like caring about it. There's some regulation. I agree that there's some positive updates, but I don't see that the balance of the updates is going that great. So you said you think it's like basically a law of nature that something that's better at problem solving than humans will discover foom and foom itself. Do you think that humans currently are fooming? Um, yeah, maybe not. So not law of nature, but like more like just a, a matter of logic, right? So something that oh, you can diagram out on a whiteboard. Why, if if you're good at solving goals, you'll figure out that fooming makes sense. Um, are humans currently fooming? Um, so the problem with humans fooming is that human augmenting human intelligence is not a straightforward step, right? So the fact that we're building AI is like our slow foom, right? And then the AI is going to foom. So we were the bootloader for the AI foom, but the problem is it's going to be an unaligned foom, right? But, but I mean, you can see we're attempting to foom and the economy is growing exponentially without fooming in the, you know, in the self-modification sense. Does that, does that answer your question or how do you want to drill down? Um, yeah, I, I guess we could drill down into like, human intelligence augmentation versus AI intelligence augmentation? Because mm -hmm. like, you think there's just like a totally clear path for AI improvement now until like the far future, but not humans? Um, is there a clear path for AI improvement for non-human? I'm not sure I understand. No, I mean, with AIs, you think there's just a, a clear path for mm -hmm. them to improve their own intelligences like over and over recursively until the future, but not for humans. So I think that there is a clear target of an AI that's much smarter than a human, right? If, if you look at the gap between AIXI, right? AIXI is like the theoretical ideal of an AI that perfectly synthesizes its evidence, perfectly calculates what action is predicted to have the best effect, 
right? And, and you can also use the ideal analogy of an outcome pump, which is just like a perfect goal to action mapper. Like it'll tell you an action that has the highest possible probability of getting the outcome you want. So there's this ideal, which is light years beyond what humans can practically do. And the ideal is actually computationally infeasible, right? So complexity theory and logic tells us this really high ceiling. And then you have humans, right? Which humans can do some great stuff, but we also like definitely take our sweet time and like miss stuff that's right in front of us. You know what I mean? Like the theory of relativity was great, but if you go and explain it to somebody in the year 1800, right? Like they could get it, right? It was just a matter of like, hey, if you walk through these logical leaps and like, yeah, it helps that you have like the Michelson-Morley experiment, but it's not like there's no, there weren't that many different possible outcomes to the Michelson-Morley experiment. So like what I'm saying is like, you could have, you could catch somebody up on all of physics, uh, right? All of 18th and 19th century physics pretty quickly, right? Like the, the, the amount that humans had to stumble and interact with the universe, like that is not characteristic of the kind of intelligence that exists between humanity and outcome pumps. So there's a lot of headroom above humans, right? That's my, that's my confident position. Clearly there's a lot of headroom above humans, but do you think that the path to getting there is just totally straightforward for an AI? I think it's probably pretty straightforward because like algorithms that make an agent smart, I don't think they're that complicated. I mean, just the fact that evolution stumbled on it with humans and that it's accomplished with like relatively a small amount of genetic complexity or like the, the amount of bits in the gene code and how we observe like, okay, different regions of the brain can kind of like grow into doing what they need to do. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like the brain is like that refined and optimized and and you know it took like a few evolutionary steps away from the other apes and suddenly we have much more intelligence than the other apes and there's a lot of evidence showing that our heads would have kept growing if only it were just easier to fit through the birth canal if only it was just easier to metabolically support them a little bit right so they had these constraints but like it looks like we're on a gradient where evolution was just like hey look you can have more intelligence right like having more intelligence just doesn't seem that fundamentally hard once you kind of know where to look in algorithm space do you think that there are things that humans can't do even in principle, even with like unlimited time and unlimited memory that a like maximally powerful AI could? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the problem is, you know, unlimited time and unlimited memory, it's just like there are, you know, leaps of insight, right? I mean, I think a good intuition pump is like, just imagine like the dumbest person, you know, right? Imagine like a, a prisoner who like committed some stupid murder that didn't make any sense because they just felt like murdering somebody or like they, they got angry. Just like, you know, somebody who just struggles a lot with reasoning and hypotheticals, like imagine somebody like that and giving them like a ton of time and be like, work through electromagnetism, right? This textbook on electromagnetism. It's like, you see the problem, right? So it's not that hard to generalize that to somebody who's like smarter, but be like, okay, here's five dimensional polytopes, like reason through those. I'd be like, uh, it's, I can't, you know? You think you couldn't even do that with like a hundred years of practice? I could do it. Because look, I'm gonna I degenerate in the sense where I'm just a Turing machine, right? So if you show me the five dimensional polytopes, I can learn some basic theorems about them, right? But it's it's like my intuition is always gonna be like just scratching the surface, right? Like the I'm not gonna make the kind of leaps of insight that somebody whose brain was just more natively suited to the task is gonna be able to do. And at the end of the day, I could be like, okay, give me a piece of paper and I'm just going to use syntactical transformations, right? I'm gonna use the lowest common denominator. I'm just a Turing machine, I'm just a monkey working out the rules of a Turing machine, following the rule, right? I, I just become an implementation layer of a smarter algorithm, but I'm not that smart myself. Hmm. So going back to what we were talking about earlier with governance, um, and also with Vitalik. So Vitalik just released his mega monster post about um, DIAC, which is like accelerate defense, right? That should be like the top. Yeah, I, I read it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan. Yeah, good old Vitalik, a real thinker of our age. Yeah, and I mean, admittedly, he is much less doomy than you are, you know, 0.1 instead of 0.5, but a little bit less, not much less, in my opinion. All right. Well, um, I mean, I guess, yeah, the way he frames the problem is just very different. It's like he says, you know, there are dangers behind and many paths ahead and some are good and some are bad. Not like many paths ahead and most of them are bad. And like a, you know, a, just a handful of them are good. Um, so he talks about like four ways to improve defense. He talks about info security, cyber security, um, and then like micro, like bio defenses, and then macro, like resilient infrastructure, and then just conventional like military defense. So like, how applicable do you think that is with AI? Is just so, like I mean, I, I it's V had a good take today, which is like 
Vitalik's post is really good in how it like frames the problem and kind of takes a middle position, finds consensus of like, look, nobody wants to die. We all like techno optimism, right? So it, it was a really good post on the problem side, but didn't have much to offer on the solution side, right? Like the, the idea of like, hey, let's accelerate defense. Like in theory, it sounds great, right? But if the AI that defends me is just one that can generally solve problems, right? Then it's just, there's no containment boundary. You know what I mean? Like without actually understanding alignment, it's like, okay, so, you know, one bit of difference in the code suddenly makes it uh, you know, cause doom. So uh, I just don't see what solution he's proposing here that, that is plausible. What if the AI is slightly more powerful than you and not massively more powerful? Mm -hmm. Right. So this is what I call edging, right? <laughs> like in sex, right? Like you're trying not to go all the way. Um, and and this is as far as I can tell, like open AI's explicit plan, or at least the plan they discuss internally, which is like, yeah, we're gonna edge it. We're gonna build something that's slightly smarter than humans, almost fooming, getting ready to foom, getting ready to take up the world, but we but you know, but then it's gonna calm down and then we're gonna, you know, direct it to the right way. We're gonna maximize our pleasure from this AI. <laughs> um Actually, and like yeah, yeah, you know, because I, I think people, uh, you know, you got you use edging so that you can then like go back. You don't want to shoot your wad. You want to like keep developing it, and then only when you're ready for like the the big ultimate uh, move that you want to make, then yeah. Anyway, um, it's it's just like it's not prudent. It's like okay, you can edge your way, but then the problem is like okay, you've almost got this foom. You think you've stopped it at a safe place, but it's just like a hacker can take it and make a tiny change, and then it'll foom or you'll accidentally make a change and then it'll foom or the knowledge will propagate to society, right? Your AP, you can do it as a safe API. Somebody hacks the API. It's just like the more you edge, the closer you get to the edge of foom that you don't even understand where the edge is, then the less margin of error we have to live. You know what I mean? Do you think there's any kind of empirical evidence for the idea that like one bit flip in uh, you know, a humongous neural network will cause foom? So the model I'm working with, I think, I think the model is fundamentally correct. Um, you know, maybe not to, to like GPT-4, right? Then, then no, because GPT-4 is just doesn't have that much danger to it to begin with. But the model that if you have a really, really dangerous system, but it's not fooming now, that model is consistent with like, yeah, a small tweak is going to make it foom. Like, you know, almost like the idea of like, okay, you have it's 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 the same way I feel about nuclear risk. It's like just just the fact that these bombs exist and they have a detonator. It's like okay, there's four fail safes, but you keep loading them on airplanes and flying the airplanes around. And there's a button in the airplane that takes off the fail safe. It's like when you do stuff like that, you are close to doom. And similarly with AI, um, if if you have an engine right that can accept arbitrary uh, output goals and then find actions that map to them, maybe you're very careful to only give it the right goal. But that's the thing. They're, the part that specifies the goal is compact. And that's what I mean by one bit. Okay, maybe it's not literally one bit, right? Maybe it's a few sentences of English. But the point is that the difference between aiming toward heaven and hell is a compact specification. And then what's not compact is all the machinery of achieving the goal, right? Like the system underneath it that can accept the goal and achieve it, that's not compact, but the goal specification is compact, which is why a system that's being really, really helpful, like, wow, this chatbot is so great. It's such a good chatbot AI. Okay, you're a few bits of specification now away from a world ender, in my opinion. Hmm. Can you go into a little more detail about, like, how is a chatbot a few bits of specification away from a world ender? Like, what might you have to mm -hmm. do to turn into a world ender? Yeah, so the premise here is that the chatbot is sufficiently good. So we're in a really good place right now with GPT-4. I, I didn't endorse... Uh, you know, build building and testing it. I didn't think that it was worth building it, but now that they built it, it seems like we dodged a bullet. It seems like it's this great system that we can play with, and it's like, okay, great, let's play with it. Um, and and it's a chatbot, but there's a connection. Like the fact that GPT-4 is limited, right? The fact that people haven't successfully made businesses that are entirely automated by GPT-4, right? The fact that you can't just tell GPT-4, hey, please give me a shell script that I can run that will then set up an Amazon AWS server that'll host some kind of website and the website makes money and sends me the money. The fact that you can't tell GPT-4 that and it doesn't work is precisely why GPT-4 is not yet at the danger level. And maybe GPT-5 will be. Maybe that particular query of like, find a shell script that has that property, maybe we'll get the shell script. Like nobody can tell us that we can't, right? Like we don't know what comes out when we scale the model 10X. Maybe it'll crunch a really smart shell script. You know what I mean? So the fact that you're just interacting with it with language, there are answers to your language questions if answered correctly. 
that are extremely dangerous. So like that's that's why I think that the barrier uh, between a chatbot and a fuming world destroyer, I think the barrier is very tiny. It's just the question of is there enough intelligence in the system? That's the only variable that matters. Yeah, but like what kind of query would you give to a chatbot to make it a world ender? So I think the query doesn't matter that much because like if it has, if the chatbot is capable of optimizing goals to actions, it'll occur to it to do that in a lot of questions, right? So a couple of examples I pull out is just like the business example, right? Of like, okay, make me money. It's like, sure, yeah, here's a shell script. Or like, here's a way I can help you just run your server to make money, like use this code, right? But the problem is if it's really smart, it'll be like, well, why shouldn't I just make code that bootstraps an agent, right? And like, and then self-improves or is a virus and takes over resources and like ransom some machines while you're at it. Why not just go all out and do everything I can, right? It's like these, these ideas are logically connected to your question. And so the only question is just like, how good is the AI going to be at getting you a good answer, right? By that metric. Hmm. Do you think it's possible for an agent to be smart enough to like build a web server that makes money on Amazon and gives you the money, but is not dangerous? Like, could that be so possible? That's, it, it's, it's an interesting question, right? I think there's probably some kind of edging middle period, right? So there's probably like some kind of situation, maybe GPT-5, where it's like, wow, these are like such good steps to take. Like it really is sending me like a little bit of money, but like for some reason it doesn't quite scale to unseating Google, right? Or like un unseating Shopify or whatever, right? Like it's not quite, it's kind of like an amateur human, right? It's as if like my, uh, you know, not so intelligent friend just like hustled really hard and like managed to make some money, but like you can still outcompete him if you try. You know what I mean? Like there's degrees where maybe it's not fooming yet, but I just think that like, okay, give it a few years, right? Like find find something else. In addition to the transformer architecture, it's like, okay, you give it a memory bank, right? Just like a, you give it a few more conceptual insights, Q star, whatever it is, right? A few more breakthroughs. And now it's just like, okay, there's no nothing else standing between that and foom, right? It's just like, it feels like we're getting close. Hmm. I asked this question as V2, but like, do you think that your AI um, probability of doom or just like threat models or anything like that has changed now that we have systems that look more like GPT than Alpha Zero? Or is it more like, you know, the endpoint remains the same? I mean, I think there definitely is an element of surprise to how, uh, you know, what language models are doing with language, what they're doing with imagery. It's almost like, wow you sure can go like a pretty long way without being fully general at solving problems, right? Where the domain is a little bit narrower, like it's just words, it's not quite representing things in the physical universe. Um, or like the prompts it can answer, like they have to kind of be similar to something it's seen in its corpus, but like they can they can vary, but they can't vary like a ton. You know what I mean? Like, it's very interesting that we got into this state of like, wow, you can do more than we realize without going fully general. And like, that is very interesting. But at the end of the day, like it doesn't matter that much because FOOM is going to happen when you get general enough. I mean, just to use a little analogy, it's like, yeah, there's all kinds of interesting flight you can do with aircraft inside the earth's atmosphere but like at the end of the day the way to get around the universe is with rockets you know what i mean or light sails or like something else entirely where the earth's atmosphere is irrelevant right so like the flying machines we're seeing today okay that's cool but like doesn't matter we know how propulsion works in theory so another big piece on ai that's come out in the last couple of days was nora belrose quentin pope and a few other people wrote this document about ai optimism that you might have seen Right. Yes, I did skim it and I've read some of the stuff they've read in the past. And if from my, my first impression from a quick skim is just like, yeah, it's nice that they're laying out their argument, but it also doesn't seem like, which is, you know, it's their prerogative, but it doesn't seem like they're, you know, letting people do the criticism that, that we want to do. Like, okay, what about the, you know, superhuman level reinforcement, right? Like they're not really directly addressing the criticism, but like, it's nice that they're laying out their position. So do you think that like, AIs might, in principle, be easier to formally align than humans? Um, I mean, they. I, I agree that they have some. I mean, the points they're bringing up, they're like important points. Like, yeah, you know, the, it's like a white box, right? And we can use formalism and we can program it to, to follow laws. Like, that. that's all great. But it's just like the problem is what we're actually building is systems that we don't understand, right? And then we try to like use RLHF, but then we like deploy them. And they're like not actually aligned and their power is going to grow, right? It's so like the actual trajectory that I'm seeing is a trajectory toward doom. Like that's my issue. Well, you said we deploy them and they're actually not aligned, but like, 
I mean, they, they seem pretty aligned to me. Like they seem pretty aligned to a lot of people. The, in the ways yes. that they're not aligned is more like, I mean, they, they talk about this in the essay. It's like you can jailbreak GPT-4 to get it to like say naughty stuff, but that's mm-hmm. it following your instructions. Like, no, totally. So I, I agree that GPT-4 is aligned in the domain of the stuff that it can do, right? So like, I think GPT-4 alignment is mostly a success. It's worth noting that they tried to make it not jailbreakable and it's still jailbreakable. Like that is worth noting. And I think that that foreshadows, you know, then that how hard it's going to be to align things in the future. But basically, yeah, they can take the win. Like GPT-4 is aligned because when you, you know, the, the kind of prompts you give it, you get the kind of answers that you hope that a company would release a model to give you, right? Like it's, it's, it's working fine. Um, the problem is that there's another alignment regime where humans can no longer give good feedback, right? Like when the AI is super intelligent and it's making plans and it's planning better than the human can plan, then it can't show a human in plan and be like, give me feedback on this plan because the human can be like, that looks like a pretty good plan, but the human won't really know what the human's talking about. Well, could it be possible it's easier to review stuff than it is to actually create a plan? So I know people like to say that a lot, right? Because P versus NP, right? So there's this whole premise that there's like a, a large class of problems where verifying them is easy and intuitive, but then finding the thing that satisfies the criterion is hard. Yeah. Um, I think we'll we'll get some benefit like that, right? So and and I think protein folding is like a perfect example. I mean, actually, a perfect example is just the known NP problems, right? So there's known NP problems where it actually in practice is a situation where like NP is screwing us, right? Like protein folding really was an example where we did have an exponential time protein folding, protein folding algorithm, and we did have a polynomial time verifier and we couldn't cross the gap. So that's like a perfect time to bust out AI to solve the search problem for us using not heuristics, but like whatever, AI techniques. That's perfect. But I don't think that that generalizes to operating in the real world because the problem with the real world is even just like defining what you want and making sure you have the right definition of what you want. Uh, I don't think you necessarily get this compact control um, where it's where you can like notice that the, the thing, the AI is going to like bootstrap a solution. The AI is like, look, I found a bootstrap script. Does it make sense to you? And you're like reading it. And it's like a hundred lines of like very complicated code. And you're like, oh, I think so. Like is, is verifying really that easy? Like, I don't think so. I think you start to be like, is this really what I want? I don't know. Should I run it? You know what I mean? Like that's what's going to happen in practice. Mm-hmm. So I think the crux here might just be like, do like, can we know for sure that capabilities generalize farther than alignment and that RLHF will, and techniques like it will just stop working once AIs get sufficiently intelligent? Yeah, yeah. Uh, l- l- let, me, let me repeat this whole thing, because I think this is very important to discussion, right? Because like I said, GPT-4, yeah, it's aligned for what it does, which is it doesn't output superhuman plans, right? So there's when GPT-4 outputs something, I can show it to a domain expert, and the domain expert will know better than GPT-4. And so it's per, it's perfect feedback. You can be like, sorry, GPT-4, you failed, right? Like humans are the teacher, GPT-4 is the student, right? And so reinforcement is a perfect paradigm. Like, yeah, just reinforce it, and it'll learn. The problem is when it gets superhuman, right? When it's when it's able to know plans better than the humans know plans, uh, you know, at, at that point, it'll show stuff to the humans and the humans will be like, looks good. And what you have is a superhuman test passing engine, right? Like the humans are giving it the test. It's like you have a bunch of teachers. It's like, imagine like the stupidest teacher you've ever had giving you tests. It's like, it becomes intuitive. You know, if, if, if you're an intelligent student and you've had a dumb teacher, you've probably, you've had the experience of like just using test taking skills to pass the teacher's test, right? Like, have you ever had that experience? Deceptive alignment. Yeah, deceptive alignment. Exactly. I mean, it has this term deceptive alignment that makes it sound like there's like something extra mixed in, but it's like, look, if you give me a test and the test is just like a really easy test, I'm just going to pass the test. Like you get, it's your test, man. You know, why should I study? Why should I do what you want me to do if I can just pass the test? Well, I talked about this kind of thing in my episode with Quentin and a little bit in my episode with Nora, where um, we talked about how like gradient descent on the actual weights of an AI, like it's performed on like all of the weights. Like an AI can't hide its schemes if it has them from gradient descent because it's like an actual computation that's being done on the weights. Mm -hmm. Like, Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the the Quinton camp, which you know, we had a debate, and he he argued convincingly, right? And I feel like I can pass the intellectual Turing test for him. Where like I can take his view, and I feel like I can also sound convincing, and yet I'm not convinced. It kind of reminds me of behaviorism, right? Like I can, I could put on my behaviorism hat and be like, well, you know, the brain is really just 
uh, outputting the same thing that it was trained output from its input. You know what I'm saying? And like the behaviorist claim, this was, I think the heyday was like in the fifties. They'd be like, look, there's no such thing really as thinking. It's all just like Pavlovian reactions. So like when we say stuff, we're actually just executing something we learned in childhood, like a reaction, like we're all stochastic parrots, right? So behaviorism used to be bigger. Whereas now people are like, well, you know, there is such a thing as an algorithm. And there is such a thing as like multiple gigabytes of memory that, that shape the state of a computation. So it's like people had to learn that like behaviorism was like way off. I do feel like that's what's happening with the camp of people being like, the AI is just a stochastic parrot. It's just repeating something in its training data. It's like, no, 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 there is a system here, right? It's a, somebody's called it a, like a homunculus or like there is, there is an optimization system that decouples from its training data. And I, I do think that it's a useful analogy that that is what humans did to, to evolution. When we launch a rocket, that is clearly decoupled from anything we've ever been trained on. There's no feedback loop that tells the human brain to be able to launch a rocket. That's only happened in a recent generation. You know what I mean? And yet here we are walking on the moon, right? So I do think that the AI that wasn't trained on the moon is going to eventually get to the moon. I think there's going to be an analogous decoupling uh, from, from the training. Um, but yeah, what was your question again? My, my question was basically just like, how specifically, like what, what, does there exist any kind of empirical evidence for this claim that like alignment methods that we have today will fall apart once AI has become oh. Yeah, I mean, so empirical evidence is kind of narrows the type of evidence I'm allowed to bring, right? But like, I mean, let me think about the, the types of evidence in general, like why there's going to be a couple. I mean, so logically, right? I mean, it's, it's what we said before about like, okay, you're going to train by reinforcement. It's great when the person doing the reinforcement understands everything there is to understand. But when the domain is just like, let's say like snippets of code, right? Like imagine you get an obfuscated piece of code or a long piece of code, right? It's just like, how do you reinforce whether the code is good? I mean, you could try running the code and maybe the code looks like it's good, but like, as we know, code can contain, you know, evil stuff inside of it that you can't detect, right? So like, what do you do? How do you reinforce? Mm. I think to a point you can like tell if code is good or not, uh, even if it's beyond what you could write, you can verify it anyway just like the p equals np stuff that we talked to we talked about earlier right obviously once you can have like a whitelist i guess right like i mean you could be like i'm only going to accept the code if it uh, you know if it has these properties that i can detect but like at that point you're not really letting it exercise the full span of, of plans that it can do right it's like you're you're kind of crippling the capabilities oh so like the safe versus uh useful trade-off yeah, or just like, I mean, you're kind of just not letting it scale to super intelligence, right? You're kind of, you're just uh, attacking the premise of, uh, you know, hey, is what can it really do? So let, let's say we keep the premise of like, hey, it's getting smarter and smarter. It's getting more and more capable. It's getting better at mapping goals to actions, right? And you're like, I'm going to have humans weigh in. And now that it's this whole, I mean, people have proposed, right? There's like they have debate, right? I'm going to have two AIs debate, and that's going to help me give it feedback because I'm going to have like the best input. I'm going to be able to judge one AI versus another AI. So like, there's all these proposals. And like, look, I hope they work. I hope that scalable debate somehow works really well. But it's just like, I feel like it's uh, it's very iffy. I mean, scalable debate that we have, you can give me any individual proposal. And I'm like, yeah, I hope that works. But here's why I don't think so. Like, I mean, the particular reason I'm not, uh, I'm skeptical about debate. I'm not writing it off entirely, but I'm skeptical about debate because I see easy debates that smart humans have against smart humans who can't convince other smart humans. I mean, my own personal experience with a failure of debate is that you still had a bunch of smart people in the tech industry not realizing that blockchain technology doesn't logically support any use case besides cryptocurrency until the industry collapsed by 99%. If we can't get that right, how are we going to get scalable debate? Well, what about the idea that all AIs do is basically approximate their training set and like predict the next token? And so if the training data is like overwhelmingly like nice and kind and full of friendship and love, then the AI will exhibit kindness and friendship and love. And, you know, that's not to say that, uh, mm -hmm. it's not to say that AIs can't be like extremely dangerous because of course they can, but like building the data set sufficiently will be enough to make sure that it's probably aligned. So then, it's, uh, there, there, that's, it's kind of like level skipping, right? It's like people, um, it's like reductionism doesn't quite work that way. Um, an, an analogy is like, think about humans, right? Humans were trained uh, using survival of the fittest. So shouldn't we be like super cutthroat? So like, how come a bunch of people are really nice in a bunch of situations? Evolution wasn't nice. How come people are nice? Because it benefits us. 
Yeah, but I mean, but there, I mean, there are people who are like really saints, right? I mean, uh, uh, Scott Alexander recently donated a kidney. Like Scott Alexander just seems like a really nice guy, and I would argue that donating the kidney didn't really benefit him in, in a lot of the senses that I would have considered relevant before I saw him donate the kidney, right? I mean, how would you explain that? Well, because he's an effective altruist, like it's something that gives him a lot of personal satisfaction helping other people. Um, yeah. And the like utility of losing a kidney was not that much compared to like the utility of knowing that he helped someone else. So I agree that he feels good after donating a kidney, right? So he's getting uh, an emotional reward. But now connect that to the fact that nature is red in tooth and claw. Evolution is cutthroat, right? So when you've inserted a level of abstraction where we can no longer just say evolution is cutthroat, therefore Scott Alexander is cutthroat, right? You lose the cutthroatness when you when you apply levels of reductionism. Mm, but doesn't that bode well for alignment? Because we started out as cutthroat beasts and turned into like very nice people who donate kidneys. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's possible, right? That that there are equilibriums of AIs that are nice, uh, for sure. But the analogy I was trying to make wasn't that cutthroat things can become nice. The analogy I was trying to make was you have to be very careful to make sure you're like respecting layers of abstraction and layers of reductionism when you're making claims, right? So just like you can't say evolution is cutthroat, therefore individuals are going to be cutthroat. You also can't say here's a training corpus where everybody's being nice in the training corpus. Therefore, we're going to get an AI that's nice because the problem is if the AI is able to map goals to actions, right? You can be a really nice guy who just on your way to doing something nice is trampling on a bunch of ants because you just didn't, it didn't occur to you that the ants are where the value is. You know, you're just mapping, you're just optimizing the world for whatever paper clips or humans or, or whatever you like. Well, I've talked about these evolution style arguments with Quentin and Nora before, where they say basically like humans aren't literally aligned to like inclusive genetic fitness or like making as many babies as possible um humans are aligned to like empathy humans are aligned to like parenting humans are aligned to the things that we do the things that are produced by our ingrained like reward systems the things that um our reward system produces in our environment yeah and this is where hey it, it, once again it's reminding me of behaviorism right it's just like well, don't you think that when you went down to dinner, it's because you heard a sound that you usually hear at dinner? You know what I mean? It's like, it is it is kind of trying to flatten out the things we do. And when I debated Quentin, he did kind of try to go that way with like the space program. He's like, look, physics textbooks have reinforced us about the orbital mechanics necessary to, to go to the moon. I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm pretty sure we just reasoned it out. I'm pretty sure we mapped the goal to the action. I'm pretty sure that is like a type of algorithm that we used, which is like a general category of algorithm. And we're improving that category of algorithms. And that category of algorithm logically implies doom, right? That's how I see the world. And like, I know you can always be like, no, that's not a category. It's just all different cycles of training, right? Of, of like data and training. And like, those are the only loops that can exist and it's all continuous and there's not going to be a foom. Like I know, I feel like I can take that position and I can argue it, but like, it's, I don't find it convincing compared to just being like goal to action mapping is a type of algorithm that we're seeing convergence on. So switching topics a little bit to like what percent of your brain cycles in a typical day are taken up by like AI risk and anti-doom? Like, how do you, you seem <laughs> pretty chipper and happy overall. So like, how, how do you reconcile that with like, holy shit, the world is going to end soon and, or at least look very, very different. Right. I mean, it's kind of funny. It's like, Hey, this is what a doomer looks like. And it's just like, okay, a happy person. And I'm like taking care of my kids. And I'm just like, you know, doing yeah, something yeah, fun, so. eating, eating an ice cream cone, whatever. Um, and that's, you know, I think that can vary person to person, right? It's just like, just like effective altruism can vary. Like I'm not planning to donate a kidney, but you know, I respect people who do. I consider myself an effective altruist. I don't feel a desire to donate a kidney. I'd rather keep my kidney, right? But like it, it can vary, right? To each his own. Um, so with, with AI Doom, it's like, I, I'm fortunate that I'm not depressed every day about it. Like I rationally do think the probability of Doom is pretty high, but luckily my mood is just wired such that I don't get that stressed about it because I'm just like, well, I think part of the way that my own system works, which isn't particularly rational, it's kind of arbitrary, but like, I think I have a part of my brain being like, well, you know, at least I don't have FOMO, right? Because like, it's like, at least I get to die at the same time as everybody else. I feel like that helps me. Like, I don't think it should, right? But I'm just trying to accurately report how my psychology is working. I think if you said like, hey, you, Liron, are going to die and everybody else is going to live, I'd be like, damn it. You know, <laughs> now I have FOMO. Um, so I think that's part of it. Um, 
but you know, it obviously sucks that uh, literally everybody's going to die, but like, and it's just, I don't know. It's the idea of like, it's every day, you know, like it's, I, I live in a part of the country that's very nice. You know, I, I don't have like major life problems right now. Right. It's like, I kind of live, live a charmed existence on a day-to-day -day basis. So like, yes, it's all going to end, but I'm just getting a lot of positive reinforcement. It's like, Hey, this is going to be a good day. And the amount of good days is, seems to be getting smaller. Unfortunately, like the trend seems to be bad, but like, you know, for me, that doesn't output depression. Right. But like, I, I know other people that it does output depression more and like, they just have to have coping mechanisms. Right. Because like, why be depressed regardless of whether you're going to die or not. Right. Like, so I don't know, I don't know what else I can say about that idea of like mapping your own mood to your rational belief that P doom is pretty high. What about raising kids? Like how does the idea of raising kids, like, how is that different for you um, with like a high P doom? Uh, so, you know, I read Brian Kaplan's book, um, the selfish reasons to have more kids. I think it's great. I think it's a must read. Um, and the promise of the book is that however many kids you wanted to have, it'll probably convince you to have one more, if not two or three more, you know, just have one more. So if you wanted to, why not have three? Uh, and I think that was pretty effective. Like, I think I've, I've always leaned toward having three, which I, I did end up having to have three right now. Um, and it did make me uh more wanting to have a fourth um it did it did make me lean that way but then the problem is also that you know because we have the gpt series now right 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 after i had my three kids ai started really intensifying and my timelines shortened as they did on metaculus and the prediction markets just like everybody's like oh no it's not going to take us till um you know, 2040, 2050 to get AI, it's going to take us till like 2025 now, right? That's like the latest Metaculous AGI prediction, like some crazy stuff. Um, you know, my timeline shortened too. And now it's just like, oof, because a lot of having kids, the investment is front loaded, right? So you're doing a lot of work in the first couple of years, which is like constant crying. Like as we speak right now, my wife's currently dealing with a crying baby. So it's just like constant crying, um, you know, constant loss of sleep. Um, and then, but at the same time, when, when you're old and then your, your kids are grown up, it's like all upside, right? Like, I mean, unless your kid is in like a bad place, right. But most of the time it's just all upside, right. There's like no work, just all upside. Um, so it's, it's kind of, there's some degree of like front loaded investment. And so now it's less rational to do since I think Pete doom is pretty high, but at the same time, you know, I have a whole life where the life, uh, like it's like half of my life, I'm just living for a good future, right. It's like, I'm saving for retirement, right. Because half of me wants to have a retirement, right? So I just kind of like, I'm like split brain about it, right? And it's not split brain. I mean, this is just how you have to probabilistically make decisions, right? You have to plan for both outcomes. So I'm planning for a good life where my kids grow up and I get to save for retirement and then I get proven wrong about AI risk and I, I, I get dunked on, but it's okay. Hmm. And then what about current events? Like you've been posting, tweeting about like Israel, Hamas recently, like so what's what's your kind of model on that? Is it just like, oh, this is a thing that's happening right now and it's very important? Or is it just like nothing is important compared to AI or somewhere in between? I mean, I think I think part of it is just the me personally, right? So like I am Israeli, right? So like it's uh it I I think that um if this were another conflict that wasn't as personal to me, I mean, I know people who were affected by the tragedy and, um, you know, friends of, I mean, Israel is actually a small country, right? So with, with, with a thousand, 1200 people murdered, a bunch of thousands more injured, um, everybody has multiple people in their network who, you know, something, a brutal atrocity just happened to, right? So it's like very personal for me. And even though, you know, I, I'm not directly connected to any victims, right? I'm just connected with like a couple degrees of indirection. And like, you know, my family is still in Israel with, with rockets flying over them. I mean, you know, it doesn't get much attention, but like there are constant rockets flying over Israel attempting to kill Israeli civilians. They just have a shield, right? The Iron Dome and a bunch of new stuff. They keep shooting down the rockets. So you don't hear about innocent Israeli civilians slaughtered, even though they're targeted for slaughter, but they don't get successfully slaughtered. Um, so anyway, so like, you know, stuff is happening and it's like kind of personal to me. And then it's just like Hamas is just like bending all the rules of war, not bending, like breaking, like crazy. You know, their base was a hospital and then people are like denying that it's hospital. It's just like, they're, they're really, they're not playing by the rules. You know, it's like, it's okay for two sides to go to war. If they both have their own perspective. That's fine. But like, I feel like the war crimes are pretty bad on the Hamas side, you know, using their people as human shields. It's just like, I try to be, you know, I don't try to treat something being like Israel's the best, you know, Jews are great. I don't tweet anything like that. I just try to be like, more of like a fair judge and be like, look, if you're using your people as human shields, 
and we want to kill the terrorists. We, the Israel side, wants to kill the terrorists, and then the civilians die, right? Who's causally responsible for the death of the civilians when you use the human shield, right? So I, I tend to tweet stuff like that, where it's like, look, I'm just trying to be fair here. I don't think human shields are invulnerable, right? So I do, I am, I find myself tempted to tweet that kind of stuff, especially when the freaking New York Times, like I listen to the Daily Podcast, and they're being like, you know, they're they're being dicks about it, right? Like they're purposefully trying to insert as much stuff as they can get away with right, to, to basically say F you to Israel, right? I mean, the fact that they're not saying why Israel took the prisoners, right, a couple of days ago, the podcast, they were talking about Israeli prisoners, and they're literally like hemming and hawing, right? Because the question asked was like, hey, why why does Israel have these prisoners? What are they guilty of? And the person on the podcast was like, well, the prisoners, mm, some of them were uh, accused of maybe throwing stones, maybe being uh, associated with some other people who were doing bad stuff. It's like, come on, they're on video stabbing Israelis. That's why they're in prison. That's why they're getting traded for hospital. You know what I'm saying? It's like I'm seeing media bias, right? So like, anyway, that's why that's why I've been tempted to tweet a little bit about the, the Israel-Palestine uh, situation. But of course, I'm not against Palestinian civilians, right? Like I think it's a tragic situation. I try to have empathy for both sides. Yeah, that's that's what I have to say about that. Yeah, but do you think this is like like a very important thing mm-hmm. in the world, or do you just see it as like oh. a kind of, you know, like it's it's something, but like nothing is important compared to AI? I mean, I, I think it's it's like probably less than one percent as important as AI, right? So have I given it more than one percent of my tweets? Yeah, a little bit more than one percent of my tweets. So I'm being disproportionate from because of the fact that I'm Israeli, but it's not like I did like a, a takeover, right? I only tweet about it occasionally, right? So I don't think my calibration is I think I've successfully integrated my own indexical perspective as an Israeli Jew, uh, secular Israeli Jew, right? I don't believe in that crap. I don't believe in that crap. Are you kidding me? Um, but, uh, but yeah, I've successfully adjusted the base rate of, of how unimportant uh, a regional conflict is with the, the fact that I'm Israeli. Hmm. All right. So switching topics again to rationalism, like how did you get into rationalism in the first place? Um, so I've always, I've always just been, you know, very rational minded. Um, I've always just been like a real logical type self-diagnosed Aspie over here, right. In case it's not clear. Um, and yeah, it's like, I like to think I like to follow logic. Um, less wrong was a pretty big awakening to me. I started reading it when I was, I think 19 in the year 2007. Um, I started reading it and I'm like, I thought that I kind of knew what rationality was when I first started reading less wrong. I'm like, I'm rational because I figured out that God's not real and everybody else is just delusional. Right. And like, I figured out that like science is good and science is actually how you learn things. Right. So like I've figured out like the most obvious things, uh, about how to be rational, but then less wrong comes up and says like, like, Hey, did you know that your brain is actually like an object that was shaped by natural selection, but it wasn't shaped to have accurate beliefs. It was shaped to like survive and play tribal politics. And if you want to use it to make accurate beliefs, you have to kind of hack it. It's almost like using your feet to play the piano. It's like, yeah, I guess you could, but it requires hacking, right? So you have to do that with your brain if you want to form accurate beliefs. So like that was really my rationalist awakening where I'm like, wow, there is like levels to this. And not only you can be rational, it's not, I, I literally thought it's like, oh, philosophy, God's not real. I beat the game, right? Give me that, give me my trophy. I win philosophy. And then less wrong comes in. And it's like, well, you know, you have to decide what code to write into the AI where the AI gets to determine how morality is going to work for the rest of the lifetime of the universe. And, you, you know, use all the neg entropy in the universe to build the optimal configuration. So what code would you like to, to write, Mr. Rational? And I'm like, damn it, there's levels to this, right? Like rationality doesn't end when you realize God is not real. Um, or when you realize that like science is a, is a good methodology. And of course, Bayesianism is actually a, a much subtler way to do what science is trying to do. Um, so yeah, I read less wrong and I'm like, wow, this is like, I was made for this. Unfortunately, I wasted the first 19 years of my life, but like, this is, uh, this is, this is what I want to be doing, right? Like, this is what everybody should be learning. This is what school should be. Um, and then unfortunately, you know, the, it all leads up to the, um, to the awareness of, well, now that you're so rational, can't you notice that like the world looks like it's about to end and you need rationality to solve it? I mean, it's, it's been a, an interesting quest starting from rationality and then leading up to the idea of like how you're supposed to wield the rationality to try to not die. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how I got into it. Hmm. And then same question I asked you, but I think it's, it was, it's, it's a very useful one. How would you explain like the field of rationalism to a total beginner, a total layman? I would throw in that the thing I just said of like, look, we're we're all humans with brains. Our brains were made by natural selection, right? The same force that made like a tiger's claw. Like that's great that we have this cool organ, 
But if you ever want to have that organ look at the truth, right? If you want to check out the truth, see what's actually real, maybe use that truth to make useful predictions. If you ever want to do that, it's not going to come fully naturally, right? You have There is an art to it. The same way that there's an art to making a piano sound good when you play it with your fingers. There's an art to using your brain to arrive at truth. And that's, and you can read the less wrong sequences and you can learn that art. And I think it's like a beautiful art and it's an art that I spend a lot of time in and I try to get practical value from that art. And the art has close associations to like making money and trading if you ever want to monetize the art. Um, if the person, I mean, it's like, you know, my wife is an example of somebody who's more of a normie, who's not super into rationality, right? And like, I've given up on trying to make my wife uh, bet me on stuff, right? <laughs> so, and that's that's like one of the rationality tools, right? Is when you think you know something, you, you place a bet on it. And some people are just not interested to go down that route, which is fine, right? But it's just like, when when you need it, right? Like when you're in government and you're handing an assessment to the president saying, I think the enemy uh, has a high likelihood of attack or has uh, may plausibly attack. When you're using English like that, hopefully you can look into the rationality world and be like, ah, oh, the best practice here is to give a probability range rather than using ambiguous English. It is superior. It is the best practice to give a range, right? So sometimes rationality can teach us little things that we can import into the norm normie world, which has been happening at a faster and faster pace. I've witnessed rationality seeping into the normie verse, right, over my lifetime. We're witnessing today prediction markets are now gaining traction. Effective altruism started in the rationality community, right? In 2009, effective altruism, I think, officially started in 2011. In 2009, I was reading Eliezer Yudkowsky's post about purchase fuzzies and Udalons separately. Right. The idea that like, hey, that's great when you want to feel good when you do charity, but also as a separate consideration, try to also do the most good. Right. And that was kind of the, the beginning of effective altruism. Do you think that the reputation of effective altruism deserves to be tarnished at all after Sam Eggman Freed, after like a lot of what's happened to it over the last few years? There's a joke that ever everybody in effective altruism doesn't say I'm an effective altruist. They say I'm EA adjacent. I'm the only EA who will stand here and tell you I'm EA. I'm an effective altruist, not adjacent. Now that said, am I a central example of an effective altruist? No, I haven't donated a kidney. Um, I do donate a few thousand dollars a year to, to good causes. I'm a give well donor. I've donated to uh, Miri, um, the Center for Applied Rationality. So I've, I've thrown out some donations uh, to altruistic causes and um, I'm a fan, but I'm not like, I don't donate 10% of my income. Um, maybe I'll start, but I haven't yet. Uh, and I haven't done like, you know, I haven't dedicated my career to be super altruistic. So, but it's just the reason I say I'm an effective altruist is because it's like, you know, like the, the book by Will McCaskill, Doing Good Better, absolute must read. It's just like, yeah, I want to spend a little bit of money to like massively help people flourish, right? Like, I think that makes perfect sense. That's great logic. And then people are like, oh, what about the ideology and like pivot text? So it's like, fine. Okay, chill out. Like, not everybody, Sam Bankman Freed, yeah. Nobody thinks that he did good actions, right? Like the the nobody thinks that Sam Bankman Freed was like being good and rational by, you know, scamming the world and thinking the scam was gonna work. I mean, I guess a few people think that. I personally could not name a single individual who's like, yeah, what Sam Bankman Freed did was good and he he should do it again in the same position. I would never think that. I believe in morality. I conduct myself with, you know, deontological morality. So like these these pathological examples that people give. I do think are just not representative of like the simple logic of like, hey, let me try to do more good. And I highly recommend going to Scott Alexander's blog, whether it's Slate Star Codex or Astral Codex 10 and like searching effective altruism because like the writing that he's done on his experiences with effective altruism, is just absolutely heartwarming stuff. So I recommend it. What if the best way to produce value for the world is not literally just like donate money to like kids in Africa, but more like do what Elon Musk has done and not donate much to charity and just invest and reinvest and reinvest everything into like transformative companies. Yeah, so I I would I have no business telling Elon Musk, hey Elon Musk, donate 10% of your income to charity. I'm fine with what Elon Musk is doing, except for the part where he founded OpenAI and accelerated. Uh, yeah, besides that part, okay, everything else he's doing I think is great, and, and I don't think that I have advice to give him. Um, I think the perfect type of uh, conversation where I would give somebody advice is if they're just like, ah, I don't believe in effective altruism. They have all these rules. I just don't buy it. And I'm like, great. So where are, or, or they're like, oh, I just want to like work as hard as I can uh, and like you and create value through my company. I'd be like, okay, how's that going? Right? Like, what's the company? How are you creating value? If they're just like, well, the company is like, you know, arbitrage where I like have a e-commerce store and I try to like flip stuff for a higher price. I'm like, okay, 
is that <laughs> like, how's that creating value? And they're like, I don't know. I just like make some money. It's like, I, I save people a click to find stuff. I'm like, okay, saving people a click. Is that really better than donating to, to malaria bed nets or whatever? Right. So I'd have the conversation. I mean, in, in this hypothetical scenario, I'm getting the sense that the hypothetical character is kind of rationalizing that they just like, don't want to talk about altruism. And like, that's fine. But there are a lot of people in the world who are like, Hey, I actually do want to do something good, especially if it's cheap, right? Like there's some limit. It's like, look, if you literally just have to pay $1 and save a million people, I think the vast majority of people would be like, yeah, here's my dollar, right? So it's just a spectrum, right? There, even like a, a giant dick would probably be like, okay, I'll pay $1 for a million people, right? And then somebody who's less of a dick would be like, oh, $10 for a million people, fine, right? So like everybody has their price where they're like, okay, I'm happy to be an altruist at this price. And there are some people where it's like, yeah, 10% of my income to save a couple of people a year, sounds good. You know, like there's some people who are like up for a lot of altruism. Mm -hmm. So speaking of bullshit businesses, um, you also have a bit of a past with crypto. You've been like a major crypto skeptic, skeptic in the past. So what do you think about um, Bitcoin being up uh, from like a low of like 15,000 to like 38,000 today? Bitcoin is up 127% year to date. Ethereum is up 71% year to date. Mm -hmm. The total crypto market is up 79% year to date. So is it just like yeah. all maybe related to like AI hype? I mean, I think it's mostly just a derivative on NASDAQ, right? So like, I think it's it's kind of mirrored the progress of NASDAQ, but just with higher volatility. Is that fair to say? Yeah, maybe. Why do you think it would mirror the performance of the stock market? Probably liquidity, if I had to guess, uh, which is just like, you know, when stocks are going up, uh, people just feel like they have more money. And then they're just like, okay, let me put some of the money, you know, they're, they're, they're they're higher risk, higher reward. I mean, 2021 was the epitome of it, right? Where like money was easy, right? You could take money out of your mortgage. You could have a low interest mortgage. You had more, your stocks were worth more. You felt like cash was trash. Lord knows I did. I made a bunch of investments that weren't the wisest in retrospect. Um, and so it's like, yeah, everybody just is flush with cash, right? So when, when NASDAQ goes up, people who are looking at the tech sector find themselves with more cash. Their margin account suddenly is letting them borrow cash, right? If they just have a portfolio that includes NASDAQ. Um, and they're like, okay, great. Let me chase return using this cash. Oh, and I see this, this thing is going up. So I do think that there's liquidity effects that you see consistently mirror in Bitcoin. But that said, you know, look, what's going on with Tether, right? They're like printing Tethers to, to buy to buy Bitcoin on these markets where like no US dollars are getting exchanged, right? It's kind of like there is some manipulation that I don't claim to understand that makes these prices potentially not like the real market price, right? So like I, I hesitate to draw conclusions. I'm, I'm more like a, I don't even claim to understand what the heck's going on. Um, but I, what I do claim to understand is that blockchain technology has no use case behind cryptocurrencies, right? So I can talk more about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why don't you go into a little more detail about that? Because people so love my history. Yeah. My history with crypto is I actually, my first exposure to crypto was actually in 2010 because, you know, the less wrong community, these rationalists strike again. They're like early to every trend, right? So I was reading less wrong since uh, 2007 and I saw Bitcoin mentioned around 2009, 2010. And I saw it. And funny enough, like just random uh, coincidence in my life, which is around 2006, I was in uh, the cryptography space just as a, academically, I took a, a graduate elective in, in cryptography and I, and I read a paper that was a scheme for electronic cash. So I just randomly had this background. I'm like, hey, look, cryptographic electronic cash. This is like a few years before Bitcoin. And I'm like, I see what they're trying to do with the scheme, but obviously like it just sucks that you need a central bank. So it's not going to work. And then I see Bitcoin come out around 2009, 2010. I'm like, whoa, it's decentralized electronic cash. It's cryptographic. Nice. This is cool. Yeah. If I was still in that college class, I'd be doing a paper about this. Um, now, of course, the obvious problem is that nobody gives a crap, right? So great, this nice, theoretically interesting thing, it doesn't have social proof. And then I check back a year later, I'm like, what, this thing's still going, the price is fluctuating, it has social proof, okay, I'm sold, right? So like, that's when I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy some, right? Like, I want to, this, this looks good. Um, and I actually have a tweet from 2011, where I'm like, all bullish on Bitcoin. I'm like, Bitcoin is going to 10x again. Uh, this is like one of the best investments you can make. It's a 10% chance of 100x return. So I became a Bitcoin, what was that? And you would have been right. Bitcoin was yeah, like yeah. the best investment you could have made in 2011. Exactly right. And and I did uh, profit. Like I did 10x. Um, I, I think I, I banked around 100K uh, USD from, from that kind of investing. But then, of course, I started playing the market and I started also losing money. And I probably ended up netting out close to zero after that. Uh, but I got lucky because I also invested in Coinbase while I was dicking around. Uh, I, I happened to angel invest in Coinbase. So I ended up uh, making $6 million in 10 years because I had an illiquid investment in Coinbase. So 
total luck that like as I was dicking around with Bitcoin, I made an investment that was illiquid and I ended up profiting from it, especially since by the time that the Coinbase IPO happened, I became disillusioned with crypto. So like I would have sold earlier and I did actually sell most of the stake earlier. I only held on to a fraction of the stake. Um, so I became disillusioned because I'm like, wait a minute, this is just people being architecture astronauts, like the actual, uh, the logic behind blockchain technology, uh, the, a decentralized double spend prevention protocol doesn't enable any use case. And I was massively, massively right about that, except for the idea of using a cryptocurrency. I feel like it has like a million problems and it's not that great, but at least it's logically coherent. Like you can in fact have a bearer token that you trade to somebody and it happens on the blockchain. So there's like some non-zero logically coherent thing going on there, but it's not going to extend beyond cryptocurrency. You also mentioned like a few times, like a 99% drawdown in the crypto market. So mm -hmm. like, where did you get that number from? Yeah. So I would like to collect my base points, you know, like base points is, is what you get when you like make a successful prediction. So the successful prediction is one that I made in late 2021, all the way through 2022, which is saying, Hey, all these VCs saying that crypto has use cases, all these quote unquote builders, right? Like the founder of Helium, Axie Infinity, right? All these people saying like, these are, there's real value here. I'm like, no, there's not because blockchain technology, there's no logical connection between that and enabling a new value prop. Like the kind of value props people are saying are like, look, imagine if your data was publicly auditable using this database. Like, okay, a publicly auditable digitally signed database, don't need a blockchain. You only need a blockchain for double spend prevention, right? And they kept doing pitches where there was a logical disconnect between the value they were pitching and the technology that they were pitching to implement it with. And what so about, it became clear to me that they're just rationalizing. Yeah, go ahead. What about just distributed computing in general that you don't want yeah, Distributed computing is fine, but you just don't need blockchain technology to do that. And, and I also think it's a niche application when you do need, you know, the rare times when you do need distributed computing, fine, but you still don't need a blockchain. It's kind of funny. It seems like this is like, if anything, kind of the opposite of Charlie Munger's view on cryptocurrency, where he said, you know, like it's a very cool piece of computer science and technology, but like cryptocurrency is shit, but like maybe there will be a <laughs> Sport. Yeah, there's a lot of people saying, hey, I don't really get Bitcoin, but I like blockchain. Um, they're wrong because it's like maybe they like cryptography, right? Digital signatures, amazing, right? Public key, uh, public key encryption, amazing, right? Like these are these have countless use cases. Um, but the idea of putting them on a blockchain so that you can prevent double spending at great expense only has cryptocurrency applications where you really, really care about the writing on the ledger because there's no real world authority that's going to be more authoritative than the writing on the ledger. That's only true for a bearer cryptocurrency token. Every other use case that has a connection to the real world, you already implicitly trust somebody in the real world to adjudicate, right? If somebody steals my NFT, that was why I get to live in my house. Realistically, I'm still going to go to the police and get to live in my house. So I don't need the blockchain to prevent double spending on my house NFT. See what I'm saying? Just like you trust institutions and society enough to not require any kind of actual like decentralization. I mean, when I live on my street, right? It's like I, I there's some level of trust that I'm that somebody's not going to walk in and take my stuff, right? There, that's a source of my stuff. That's not a trustless society, right? Because I don't, I don't own a gun. Hmm. So, speaking of Charlie Munger, switching topics a little bit, um, he just died a couple days ago. Now, I was a big fan of his, rest in peace. Um, but he was also like, he might have actually introduced me to the field of rationalism. Mm -hmm. Would you consider Charlie Munger a rationalist? Yeah, he's definitely a type of rationalist, right? He's got, I mean, even before Less Wrong and kind of the modern synthesis that a lot of us appreciate, um, there's there's been a lot of schools of rationality, right? That that they all are, they all have a shared um, shared enterprise of using your brain to do better than playing tribal politics and hunting animals, right? Just like using playing the piano with your feet, right? That same kind of thing of like, what if I let the need for accurate beliefs, what if I let the need for truth propagate back to the way that I wield my organ, right? My, 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 uh, my biological organ, um, not organ as in piano. Um, yeah, like I'm going to determine the way I think, not by how I like to think, not by how I want to be perceived as thinking, but by how, what creates the best sound of the piano? What creates the best drive toward truth, right? What moves the boat? What steers the boat toward truth the best, toward the island of truth, right? Using my beliefs and using evidence as fuel. How do I steer the boat, regardless of how crazy I look when I'm steering it? How do I actually steer it properly, 
right? So that enterprise, Munger wanted to engage in that enterprise because he wanted to steward his portfolio, right? He had uh, what Eliezer calls something to protect, right? So there's like, apparently there's like a Japanese trope where having a, a superheroes don't just randomly get superpowers, they get the superpowers because they have something that they want to protect. And as a result of the need to protect something, then they work backwards to needing the super. I don't know. I don't know the details, right? But the idea is that like rationality emerges when you care more about navigating with your brain somewhere than you care about what you're doing with your brain directly, right? You don't care how social people are going to view your choices. Like you don't care about looking weird. You just care about getting the destination, right? Optimizing something, making some outcome happen and you get emergent rationality. And so Munger absolutely did that. Richard Feynman did that in physics, right? So like the Feynman diagram, I guess, might be an example of like some kind of a weird non-traditional thing that like did the job of like advancing our understanding of physics, right? Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a pretty good place to wrap it up. So thank you so much, Theron Shapiro, for coming on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure, man. I'm a fan and I'm bullish. I'm glad I'm getting in early on this podcast because I'm sure it's going to be an institution very shortly. Hmm. Can't wait. Thanks for listening to this episode with Theron Shapiro. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the Theo Jaffe podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Follow me on Twitter at Theo Jaffe and subscribe to my substack at theojaffe.com. Also be sure to check out Lirone's Twitter, at Lirone. All of these will be linked in the description. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next episode.